Sure. Showing here that it is live on Facebook now. Right, I so can see good? a sign. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Bob. All right, we good? Right. All right. There we go. Let's get, let's uh, kick it off. Let me get my notes. Right. Good to go. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, welcome to day one of the Thank You Plant Medicine slash Ouroboros Story Hour storytelling sessions at the first ever World of Wisdom. I'm your host and producer, Bob Cohen. I'm a dad, writer, teacher, and blues man. When I'm not stuck at home playing hide and seek with COVID-19 and doom scrolling about the end of Western civilization, I'm busy teaching writing and literature and working on a memoir about the convergence of clogged arteries, financial catastrophe, a lifetime of unresolved trauma and psychedelics and late middle age. Uh, people often tell me, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna skip that, sorry. So a few words about photography and recording. This is being broadcast on uh, Zoom and Facebook Live and I plan to record the event. So if you're camera shy and joining us on Zoom, um, Make sure you turn off your video feed so that people don't see your face. Um, so to storytellers, remember, um, no video conference platform is truly secure, including the ones that say they're encrypted. So please avoid mentioning incriminating details that could result in identifying friends, locations, medicine workers, or organizations of ceremonies in jurisdictions in which plant medicines and psychedelics are considered illegal. So the world of wisdom is a simple framework of 10 guiding principles for welcoming personal, local, and global challenges using curiosity, playfulness, and co-creation. It combines timeless wisdom, modern knowledge, and human creativity. World of wisdom is more than festivals or retreats. It's an experiment in human development, a place for all of us to explore, grow, heal, connect, experiment, play, and co-create. And their mission I think dovetails with uh, the Thank You Plant Medicine mission and uh, the Orbor Story Hour mission, which is we're really trying to figure out how to um, heal the world through both healing ourselves and healing the people around us. So Thank You Plant Medicine um, is a movement, um, is a diverse global collective of individuals, groups, and organizations united by a deep gratitude and appreciation for psychoactive plant medicines and psychedelics. Ouroboros Story Hour um, is a multi-city, monthly, live, unscripted storytelling production. Our mission is to promote deep personal and societal healing and radical acceptance of ourselves and others by sharing and witnessing stories about experiences with teaching plants, psychedelics, and other consciousness hacking practices. We offer a co-created we offer co-created safe spaces for people to share their healing journeys and potion and personal explorations on both sides of the microphone. One of the things that um, one of the things that's really important to me when we uh, when, when, I, when I host these kinds of sessions is that I try to create happenings, a moment, and I try to dissolve the boundaries between storytellers and story witnesses, so that we kind of come together and have this and, and make this thing that's that belongs to all to everyone in the room rather than just just people who were standing on the side of on 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 the uh, on on the down spotlight side of the microphone where uh, where where they're, where they're doing a performance rather than sharing something from deep inside um, so our storytellers our Ouroboros storytellers uh, hour presents people with stories to share and experiences to integrate um, most of the people that I put that 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 I bring, that I bring into the space are sel they're seldom actual performers or intentional performers. I mean, this is sort of a performative thing, but at the same time, I really look for people who have real raw stories rather than for people who are highly performing, highly polished performances. It's really where, for me, to my mind, where all the, all the, uh, the magic happens. So here are a few reminders as we kind of go forward. Uh, so the first is that I usually call this a share, not a show. Because uh, the idea is to gather to co-create unique moments for people to share their healing journeys and where we can learn that radical acceptance thing. Um, so sort of an interesting thing about radical acceptance that I have found is that um, it usually it really has to start with ourselves. Uh, I don't know if this is this happened to me in almost every ayahuasca ceremony I've ever been to. I've gotten into the room and somehow or another, I always wind up next to people that I don't like. 
for what I don't know them. I'll just look at them and I'll have this sort of like very visceral reaction to them. And I'm like, oh, I don't like them. And then when I get done with the ceremony, I realize that the reason why I don't like those people is because they remind me of something I don't like about myself. So when I get done with it, you know, and I'm all full of the love and, and, and I have that recognition, I realize really what's going on. So if we can start from that place, you cut out a whole bunch of people that you don't like because, because, you, because you, you've learned to like yourself. So the stories and views expressed by the storytellers belong to the people who share them. So just that's just kind of like a sort of, you know, welcome, to, welcome to America. We're always worried about getting sued. So um, I try to make sure that people understand that um, the entities that are holding space here, like Thank You Plant Medicine or World of Wisdom or even even my project, that we're not explicit, ex explicitly promoting the use of illegal substances. Um, so that leads me to something that I always tell people in, um, in the live space, which it's less of an issue for us here. Story hour, this, these storytelling sessions are substance free for a couple of reasons. So, you know, one of which is that uh, I don't want to be associated with, um, with places where people can score drugs. Um, my standard joke here is to is Grateful Dead concerts, but I think we they, we may get that may get lost in the uh, in the translation. But the idea is that I want people, I hope people come to be and that they're present, but in any ordinary reality while we share these stories, and that we avoid um, that, that we avoid any entanglements with law enforcement. Um, I think everybody here is experienced with medicines, but. I often have, when I run these things, I often have people who are curious about it and who don't have experiences. So I always remind them entheogenic substances or psychedelics um, are safe, but they're also powerful medicines. If you feel called to this path, please do your own research and use good judgment. And here's where I'll pause and say, it is possible to re -trauma, to traumatize yourself further in the people come to do this because they want to get healed. But if the set and the setting aren't right, you know, if it's not a good space and you don't have good guidance, you can make things a whole lot worse. So make sure you understand what you're putting in your body, fundamentally what it does and, <coughs> excuse me, and, 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 and that you're around people that you can trust. I've heard, I, I'll tell you, I've, I've heard stories. Um, so tonight, or actually this afternoon, right? Um, or depending on where you are, we're going to hear from uh, four storytellers. So Jonathan Glazer, Lorena Khan, Gerardo Guerrero Ibarra, and Lisa Ward. Um, so usually what I do is I warm up the I warm up the crowd by telling a story first. And one of the what one of the things that I struggled with early on when I start, first started doing psychedelics was this idea of what's a good trip. So just by way of, you know, just by way of biography, um, this is 2020, I've only been intentionally using medicine for healing since 2015. And that, and, 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 and my medicine journey didn't kick into high gear until 2018. So from 2016, 2015 to 2018, I was microdosing and, and I had one five gram mushroom trip. So it was sort of like getting myself sorted and it took a couple, it, it took several years for me to get connected to um, an underground ayahuasca community um, here in, 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 in Massachusetts, at which point things blew up and, and became a whole big, it became a whole big, the, 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 the journey changed significantly and, and sped up. But in the time leading up to that, um, I would periodically trip when I was at home. I would wait because I, I I teach so I'm not, you know I'm, I'm I teach college so I don't have to go to work nine to five every day so there was a day back in 2017 when um, my wife and son were at work in school my daughter was um, studying at Leeds University for her semester abroad um, so she was three thousand miles away in England so you know I waited till everybody got up and out of the house I made myself. Um, uh, a two and a half gram um, dose of uh, mushroom tea, drank my tea, put on my headphones, fired up the, uh, the, the, the Johns Hopkins uh, mushroom trip, um, six hour extravaganza to help, to help shape the trip. And I laid down for a nice warm uh, winter's nap. 
So I'm lying there listening to music, waiting for, uh, you know, wait, 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 waiting for the effects to come. And you, you know how it's like time, you know, time doesn't, you know, time really becomes hard to track at some point, but somewhere, you know, somewhere, somewhere past about 8.30 in the morning and probably about 10-ish, I started coming up and I felt it and I was having this really wonderful trip, you know, um, it's funny thing is that when I tell the story, I don't really remember what the trip was anymore, but um, it, it, it was, I moved inside. I was you know, having that, having that sort of like ideal trip story arc, you know, where you feel it coming up, you know, you see the, you, you see the, 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 uh, the fractals and, you know, Jesus and all that, all that other stuff. And I heard the phone ring you know well actually what i first heard was my cell phone ring because they i knew i knew enough to turn the um to, to turn off the uh, the ringer so i hear bzz, bzz, bzz. so i'm thinking oh must be my daughter she always texts me around this time um, and it was really sweet like she texted me every day while when, when she was uh, in england and i was like this will this will keep till later bzz, 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 right so that goes on for some period of time and then it stopped so I'm like, okay. So I'm kind of falling back into this, you know, this kind of like reverent, holy space. Um, I'm, compl- I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm getting up. I'm, I'm pretty far up on the uh, on the on the uh, on, on on the curve for, for peaking, and then the the phone rang. So so this now now it's my house phone, and. We have we have a landline, but mostly the only people who ever call us on the landline these days are bill collectors. Anybody that we like or care about calls us, um, you know, calls us on our cell phones. So I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to bother with that. Ring, 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 stops. Ring, 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 stops. Ring, ring, ring. The message machine picks up, and I hear my wife, Bob, pick up the phone. Let's go. So I'm like, oh, okay. Now, now keep in mind, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm peaking. So now I get, and I get on, and so I go, you know, I kind of shook myself a little bit and I go, well, what's going on? And she said, Olivia lost her wallet. She needs to talk to you. So now remember, Olivia's 3,000 miles away. So I'm like, okay, because now I know that I have to be supportive, but I also, being, you know, being a dad, like my go-to thing is to fix the problem, right? So my first thought is like, I got to get all the credit cards canceled, right? So I'm like, uh, all right. So I call her up and I go, what's going on? So she tells me the story about she's on the, she's on a bus. She's got like three, 400 pounds in her wallet plus, um, uh, plus, plus, plus some you know, her, her, her cards. And she said, I put, I set it down. And I left it there and I didn't pick it up. And now I'm, she was, she, she was at Leeds. So I, I don't know, she was on some road. She told me what it was, I don't remember. So like, typically in that moment, I would say, okay, hang up. I'll cancel the credit cards. And, 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 and I would take like a very pragmatic approach to, do, to doing this. But she was crying and she was really upset and I could tell and I could feel it in a way that I really never could feel. My, my level of empathy was, was, was significantly heightened. So I just said, tell me, you know, I just listened, I said, tell me all about it. So now she's crying, she's pouring out this, you know, this torrent of, of, of regret and emotions. And it went on for, you know, really, it went on for, what felt like a, a very long time. So then I could like, and this is the craziest thing. Like I could actually feel, you know, the sort of the ebb and the flow of the emotions. I could feel them peaking and I could feel them subsiding. And when I came to that moment where I knew that she was ready to address the more pragmatic things, I said, you know, are, are you, I said, you're, I, I said, are you ready to, you know, deal with the, 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 the pragmatic stuff. And she said, a big sigh, you know, yes. So, okay. 
So then I call up the, you know, I call up the, the international thing for the credit card companies. Now I'm here. I am like still, you know, fly, you know fly, flying high, as I say, trying to, trying to navigate, um, the, vo the you know the 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 the, the call centers things so where you know press one for this press four for that press six for this you you know and then you get a person and it's like now I have to explain what's going on I have to like find my credit card my credit card so I can give them my number so we can and so I kind of navigate this whole thing and somehow or another I get it I get it all squared away all the cards are canceled. And you know, so now we just have the issue of, 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 of lost cash. So I get back on the phone and go, right, here's where we are. Are you okay? And she was sort of, so in this like half hour or so, while I was getting all this sorted, she said, I just got a message from somebody on Facebook. So, oh, and apparently some, some young lad from Leeds found her, um, Found, found her uh, her wallet and went to the trouble of looking her up on Facebook. So I said, okay, well, let's make sure that you go someplace very safe. Um, so where you know where else do you go in England but to a pub, right? So they met they met at a pub. <laughs> yeah, I see Lisa's laughing. So they 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 they, they met at a, they met at a nearby pub. Um, he produces her wallet. Every every was it shilling or pence? Every, every penny, like every, 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 every bit of the money is there. The cards are there. She says, you know, can I give you a reward? The, the guy says, no, thank you. Can I buy you a pint? No, thank you here. So we have the, you know, we, we end in this, we, we have this happy ending. So now I've kind of like completely altered the energy of my, uh, of, of my, my trip. And it's kind of like gone from this inward thing to this outward thing. And it was so extraordinary to really feel like the distance collapsed and that the, the, the energy was felt in both directions. I knew like unequivocally that my daughter felt held in a way that, and, 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 and held in a way that I could, may as well have been there where I just could have, could have, could have pulled, her to my, pulled her to my chest and held her, patted her head and you know, said there, 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 there. And it was, a, having access like to that kind of thing over such a such a great distance was really quite extraordinary so i end here sometimes i tell sometimes sometimes i tell a lot longer version of this but you know because of the format i'm going to kind of like kind of end it here i sort of like ended with this question of what does this experience mean and in a, in an audience where i can like really interact with people i'll ask them did i have a good trip or a bad trip I know what I think, but it was, I was, my, 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 my life was so much better served by that trip than the one that I had planned. Because it, it, it just, it, it, it kind of like just allowed me to sort of like reach across the, you know, re reach across the ocean. So I'm going to end it right there. Uh, okay. So. Here's the weird. Here's the weird thing. Which I, Bob, are we allowed to ask questions about that? The... Oh, of course you can. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, if anybody wants to ask questions, if you're in the audience, you can run them through chat, and the panelists, you're all welcome to ask questions. Sure. Great. I'm. Do you have a question? From a few more people. Yeah. Didn't you get pissed off that all this came into your trip? Like really? <laughs> well, see that's see that's the thing, right? I didn't. I'm well, sure you did. You know, like no, no, I didn't. It was sort of like I mean, to be honest, I was like uh, I was sort of more afraid that I was going to get in trouble from my wife for you know for for taking mushrooms in the middle of the day than I, than, than, than I was mad because I mean she knows I do it, but you know it's sort of like we 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 we're not like. She's not part of my um, a part part of my medicine orbit, and so she's like not judgmental, but you know there's you know she's skeptical about what I'm doing, and especially several years ago when I hadn't you know before I had gotten to the point where you know the, the, there there was very clear evidence that it was worthwhile for me it was worthwhile for me to be 
doing this medicine practice. So I was like, oh fuck, I'm in, I'm in big trouble. And so I kind of like that, you know, that really became like the, 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 the emotion that I was most worried about. But you're, that idea that you're sort of like cluing into being pissed off, that's what, that's like the crux of my question. Did I have a good trip or a bad trip? And, you know, like in that act of sort of like doing, like doing the machinations of, of, you know, canceling the credit cards, but most importantly, being so much more available to my daughter in ways that are not like natural to me, not natural to my cultural programming was it, it very quickly, like once I kind of pivoted into that, like that piece of it, then it became a very beautiful experience. Can I ask yeah. Bob, please? Sure. Uh, so, what do you think you've uh, you've you've learned from it, or do you think there was subsequent benefit from you having that experience? Oh, what I learned is that good trip, bad trip is all in our head. Number one, and the the, the two big benefits that sort of come up from that is the idea that good trip, bad trip is a, is a, is a construct, but also it deepened my relationship with my daughter because you know you get like she was um, she was a junior in college at that time so she's like 20 years old right so this is a time when you know when we were all we were all sort of like pushing our parents away and you know, trying to burst out into the world and to have like a moment where I could be like daddy instead of dad in a way that was welcomed was you know was really it's huge because it's I mean I, I'm it, it, this is a little bit more about my biography. I actually took a lot of years off to be a stay-at-home dad. So I'm very invested in my children. And it's been pretty hard for me to, um, for, for them to grow up because, uh, you know, because I, because I just, I mean, not, neither of my kids, they, they, I held them in my arms until like, until they said stop. Like they, neither of my, they, they, their feet never touched the ground until they were about two years old. I mean, I, I I just, I, I love, you know, I loved my babies. I loved my toddlers. I loved my, my, my adolescents. And so here we are like in this, in, in, in this space where it's like, she's 3000 miles away and going out into the world. And to have that, to have that opportunity was really just, it was brilliant. And it was great for both of us. I think it's kind of like set the stage for, you know, where we are now. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? So one other thing that, you know, it, actually one other thing to think about is that it's really interesting how much our brains can, are, are like how, it, it was a lot less hard for me to like switch in back into ordinary reality than I would have imagined. It was like, you know, like if I'd have, if I'd have had like, if I was analogously intoxicated from alcohol, you know, I would have been slurring my speech and, and and, and, and it's just, it was really extraordinary how I could sort of like switch back into ordinary reality and be clear in, 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 in my dealings with people. There is one thing I forgot to tell, and this is it's kind of like a fun detail. Before I, um, before I got on the phone with the, the credit card companies, I called up my therapist and I go, look, I got to talk to you right now. I said, do I sound normal? <laughs> I said, you know, but, but like, but is this like, because I wanted to like, make sure that, you know, I, I wasn't going to be, you know, what we might imagine. So, yeah, so that's, um, th 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 that's, that's the answers to your questions. Um, any other questions? Folks are welcome to uh, text them as well. No? Okay, brilliant. So let's press on. So that's, uh, that's my Randy, story. Randy, uh, uh, Randy is asking about the 10 second summary of substance and dosage for those of us who got here late. Oh, 10 second summary of substance and dosage. All right, so here in, in this story in particular, it was uh, psilocybin mushrooms, uh, which I grew myself, and the dosage was 2.5 grams um, dried. Which is, a, that's kind of like, a, it's another thing. Like I, I, later in the week, I'm gonna talk about dosages because uh, I, I know a lot of people who like to, um, most people I talk to, like they want to, they want maximum dosages because they're looking for ego death, and so. Uh, we, we, but I want I want to talk about that uh, later in the week, so so there we are. Um, let's move on. So we said that um, the first person up 
after the, of the uh, scheduled storytellers is going to be um, Gerardo Guerrero Ibarra. He was born in Mexico, educated in psychology and traditionally trained in shamanism and ceremony practicing practice. He's uh, an accomplished, he is an accomplished, he's accomplished in artistic symbolic interpretation of sacred Hikuri peyote people art and intercultural pedagogy education. He's a teacher and med medicinal practitioner of sacred rituals into special ceremonies with sacred seed planting and cosmo vision of four directions and elemental forces interacting with the community in ancient sacred Zia maize corn rituals. His extensive cultural immersion with the Navitel town of uh, sacred Akuri, petty people and ethnographic and symbolic studies of meaning of their sacred art in their visionary ritualization and sacred ceremonial attentions to the plant medicine. Uh, communic he was um, okay, communication and its ritual consumption and guidance with the master plan and its natural superpowers. Uh, so he's planning to tell share a story about peyote. So Gerardo, um, yes. we'll, we will pass it on to you. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Hi, everyone. <laughs> well, uh, what I'm going to share now is not a trip report. It's not the one experience that I that I have. It's, it's the whole experience that I have been having with, with this indigenous community. It's a Huichol community. The real name is Huirarica community, is the real name of this tribe. And, and I'm going to give a little bit of context. I went to this community because I, I was a teacher doing my social work from my university. I was a teacher in a high school there. In, in an education project ba made by this community. So I was a Spanish teacher. I, I gave geography and other subjects in this time period of time that I, where I, when I was there. And before this, I already had some experiences with psychedelics before. But the interesting thing is that I have never done it in a like cultural context as this, you know, like in their original tradition context. And, and the first time I took peyote there was in a ceremony because uh, the teachers from, from this school, I was by this time very, we were friends and they started to invite me to the family ceremonies that they have about the, the crops that they grow, the corn, the squash, whatever, you know. And they, they gather, all the family gathers to work on the field in order to then uh, start to grow the food and whatever. And, and in one of these moments, because there was a lot of ceremonies that I was invited, they offered a little bit of peyote, you know? And, and I took like three pieces and then I started to work with them, uh, like cutting the grass and a lot of stuff that they do. And, and I start to feel like the energy of what they were doing, the connection from, from the land. And, and I start to like understand all the process of what they were doing without any of them telling me what they were doing, you know, because they, they speak with radical language and some of them, they don't speak Spanish very well. So that's the first connection I got, I got with peyote. You know, it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful experience. And then I started to feel like some things about me feeling that I was supposed to be there with them, you know? 
this is like the whole immersion that I was into peyote. And then they start to invite me more and more to more ceremonies, more ceremonies, more ceremonies. And in some of them I took peyote and in some of them I didn't took. But the interesting part is that I have the experience about knowing the difference of taking it by yourself in a different context, the city or going to from camping with your friends and you know, and having them in this particular case, peyote in the very traditional context of a um, native uh, tradition, you know, and and I have been in a lot of ceremonies in a lot. Some of them lasting like eight eight uh, days, non stopping eating peyote, and and. What I got from this is that I, it helped me to understand better the cultural significance of the rituals that they, they were making. You know, it's like the peyote was giving me the this kind of information of what was happening energetically in every ritual that they make during these ceremonies. You know, and and. This is where I was very interested in their culture and I wanted to explore more, you know, more the deep significance of what they do, what the peyote gives to them and this. So I started to understand that there's like a whole uh, how can I say it? Initiate, initiatic process shamanism happening there and it's like not not all the people knows everything about the culture you know is these shamans the more deep that you get into this is the more significance and more connection with nature with, with the rituals with everything that they do and also for example some of the shamans have like a different language that no, but no, no, all the people can understand, and it's because of in this uh, path, they start to get more concepts, more experience that not all the people understand. So there's a different language about this, and and so it's very difficult for them even the, the same people to share the significance about what they experience in this wait, path. Wait, I have a question though. Uh -huh. I have a question. What? I have a question. Okay. Uh, if we could, um, maybe we could hold questions till he's done. That way- Oh, um, just... oh okay, okay. I'm sorry, Bob. I'm sorry. Ah! No, 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 not a big deal. Just, um, just format wise, let's- all right, great. Go ahead, Aurora. Horny, nigga detected. Horny, nigga detected. Horny, nigga. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Horny, nigga detected. I, I, I think we just got Zoom bombed. Oh, Jesus. Is that what that yeah, is? I will, I will remove it. Yeah, um, it was her. I think it's coming from what's it called? Lisa Ward. I think she's Zoom bombed. No, no, no. It's not Lisa Ward. Uh, uh, Who's good? Right, I'm. I'm We're good. Jonathan, John, Jonathan, you're the. Uh... Yeah, I, I removed the. Uh... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, Gerardo. <laughs> little little comic relief, I guess. I'm telling. You. All right, we good? Yeah. So the question was? <laughs> no, we, we are going to wait for questions for the end. You can continue. Oh, with okay, okay. okay. So, so uh, 
my main um, what I want to share is that it's very different. It's very, very, very different when you do psychedelics in a context of a culture that everything that they do, all their like, even the calendar, the cycles of when they do certain things through the year. Hey, I'm sorry, what are we talking about again? I think it was another interference. Oh. Something about. Uh, it's, it's, now, how does uh, that work? Uh, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So when when this this cultural meaning is related to the use of a substance, in this case, like peyote, um, I think it becomes more like a communal experience you know it's, it's not like oh i trip about this about that it is it is but it's also very related to what you do the practices that you do the that you start to get more deep meaning about what your family does every year with the crops and whatever you know it's it's like you get more into communication with nature too and and it for for a person that was born there and start to it lives there all their life and um, i think is is like um, a tool for them of living of because also the they teach the people uh, how to relate with nature and the spirits of nature, how to understand and how to relate better with them in order to get the food that they eat every day, in order to being healthy, not having problems with any of the spirits of nature and a lot of things, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex cosmovision and it's very interesting. And so, so it's, it's very intricate. It's very related. Uh, the use that you give to the plant and the context where you eat it, you know? Because when we, as, as Occidental people, we eat it in Occidental places and you know, we are immersed in a culture and, and we start to make or to, to open path to these plants and medicines. But it's very different doing it in a context where it's part of the life, you know, it's, it's just part of the life. Even the, the infants, the little ch childs eat it when they are childs, you know, so they start to, to do it when even there's a there's a story that back some years like centuries ago they used to the first thing the first food that they used to give to the babies was a little piece of peyote you know so they they, they start to make the connection with the plant at the very moment they they were born you know so so Yes, that's, that's my, st my story. And I think we have not so much time for me to explain you a lot of things that I have learned about the culture. And I also start to get deep into the significance of the art that they do. I don't know if you know the, this, this kind of art. I'm gonna show you a piece. that I have learned about the culture. And I also start to get deep. Do you see it? Yep. Yeah. Yep. OK. Brilliant. Thank you. And, and that's a description of uh, some of your experiences, Shadow? 
What? That's the description of some of your experiences through the art that you do? Okay, so, so I can be explaining this artwork like for maybe one hour, you know, because it's, it's very deep, but what this means in general is a moment, a moment of the developing of the air where some of the ancestors um, make it, made a deal with the spirits of nature about getting another step of developing of life, which we're going to be introduced a new species, species yes, that is us. So they are like getting all prepared for us to be able to develop. You know, like for example, this is also the first uh, corn ceremony. Wow. And it's and it's also related to the flood that was in back in time. So before this is where they were making the preparations, and after the flood is where they gave us the tools. The corn is the like physical tool uh, for being able to be present and nourish ourselves, our body and everything. And the peyote was like the spiritual food, you know, or, or the spiritual tool to comprehend and not, and keep on that track about like uh, honoring the spirits of nature and, and everything, you know. Thank you. And can I ask one more question, Bob? Yes. Uh, as, as World of Wisdom is about a solution to local and, and, and global problems, uh, from, from your story, what's the, what can be a, an understanding or, or an insight that you have uh, related to your life? Uh, but you have many experiences, but maybe one insight that you can share. Okay, so the first or the main thing is that it's very, very, very important for us that because in, in our culture, these plants were relegated, you know, were left apart for a very long period of time. So it's very important for us to give like a sacred con context to them. Not seeing them as a tool to experiment or whatever, you know, is giving them from the beginning the importance that they have and doing, trying to do them in this kind of context, that's like sacred context in nature, you know, and giving them like a significance for what you are going to do, but because it's a communion with the, with the sacred plants, you know, and, and I think it's the most important thing and also, it's very, very important that we start to connect, reconnect with these people that they have all this knowledge already practiced. They are practicing every day, you know? So, so it's very important that we try to understand their context of doing it and, and trying to um, reconnect with them in, in all the in all levels, you know, like cultural level, in land, economics, everything. Also, for for example, what I'm doing is I'm trying to to empower this um, this project of education because it's, it's what they are trying to do uh, to save their traditions, you know? Because they teach the, the young guys uh, the cultural part 
and also the part that has to be with occidental teachings, you know? And, and what I'm trying to say is to be, to, to do is to be a, a bridge between them and the occidental culture and for, be, for them being able to express what they do through, through art because art is like the, I think it's, it's a tool that we can use to teach or educate the people of what is happening there, you know? And, and also giving them an economic opportunity for them to be develop better the, these, these um, projects of education. Uh -huh. So, so these kind of things, this this kind of preoccupations, we need to to or or networks we need to do because these traditions uh, are a little bit in danger. So we need to learn from them and help them from the position we are uh, to conserve them and you know like helping them to develop them or maybe trying to to solve the problems of cultural crash that that happening that are happening and, and a lot of things are happening there you know for and it's very important to that we go into that to comprehend what is happening with these traditions and with these cultures you know yes Thank you. Uh, Randy, I think you had a question too, right? Uh-huh. Me? Yep. I actually, uh, I, I don't know how you knew that, but I, I was going to ask a question. <laughs> I, drink, I, I drink ayahuasca, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was going to ask uh, if you can say more. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, I was going to, I was going to ask if you could say more about how the, the culture feeds, um, small amounts of peyote to the uh, the, ba the babies or young children, uh, if that's only sub-perceptual doses or if there's, uh, if the, if they're able to experience psychoactive effects at those young ages. Yes, they, they actually, one of the things that uh, we do at the school is we bring these, these guys to the ceremonies and the teachers uh, explain them every ritual that they are doing during the ceremony. So the class, we took the class in the ceremonies, in the ceremonial centers, and and it's it's not that the teachers go and tell them, hey, eat the peyote, you know, because it depends on the family context. Some of the families are very traditional and. Are they already, these young guys already have taken a lot of peyote, but there are some families that have not, they don't have that, that contact with the plant, you know? So they left open the possibility that if the guys are curious about it, they can do it. They can take whatever they can or, or whatever they, they want. But yes, um, a lot of young guys have already taken a lot of peyote in ceremonies, you know? And also I have some artwork from my students and you can notice in the artwork, the experience that they already have with peyote. You, know? you can see that they start to comprehend the culture and they express that. So this is like a way that they can, you can see if the artist of the, the, whoever is doing the art is, is deep into that or not, you know? And I don't know if I answered the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'm just curious, like how, how young um, your students are. Ah, how like, young? Yeah. They are like from 16 to 25, more or less. Great. So any more questions? Well, Gerardo, thank you so much. Uh, it's hard to, you know, 
we can do this. And uh, you know, with, with the plat with this platform, we can try. A ra we have, we have like a you can raise your hand, um, so so the speakers can get a little uh, a little little of the love back. But thank you so much. So moving on, um, let's see. We're going to go oh, to Lorraine. Yep. I forgot something. That if you are interested on the art, because uh, we are selling these pieces of art. If you are interested, I can give you my contact. Uh, or if you want to know more about this project, this education project, or to know the artist, or whatever you want to know about this, uh, with pleasure, I can help you with whatever you want. Well, why don't you uh, put the stuff in the... Um, I mean, go ahead, Jonathan. Yeah, I think we were going to say the same thing. If you can put it in the link of the, of the live so we can uh, go back to it, it's on the Facebook yeah. page. And you can put the address and the information. I would definitely like okay. to check it out. Sure. And you can put it in, the, I, was, I was gonna say you can put it in the chat as well. So either, either one of those will work uh, or both of those will probably be ideal. All right, so moving on, um, Lorena Khan was born in Mexico, uh, educated in communications and is a traditionally trained medicine woman, ceremonialist teacher, practitioner of ancestral rituals. She refers to herself as a Mexican medicine woman and environmental act activist. Um, she heals through Okan, I, I apologize, I'm, I know I'm not going to get these right, uh, Okan Nabane and Ajka Maya, maybe you'll help us out with that. Uh, Ancient Paths of Mistec, uh, Zapotec, and Maya people. She is best known for her leading role in organizing tribal practices as a priestess of Mexico's heritage, living root or roots of light with indigenous and ethnic sacred rituals. She practices healing arts and traditional medicine ceremonies. Uh, she's an unconventional herbalist and alchemist of medicinal ritual cacao. She works with diverse sacred dances, oracles, art therapy workshops, Tenmas Kali Sweat Lodge. She's a specialist in pre-Hispanic gastronomy <clears throat> and indigenous culinary traditions and medicinal cuisine. She's a guardian of the Itzama Temple Mayan God. And uh, I'm, 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 can you help me with this? Is it um, Hopili, uh, Prince and Flowers of Aztec, uh, Flowers of Death? Aztec gods. So Lori plans to share a story about entheogenic experiences using plant medicine. So I just want to have like a, by way of context, Lori and I were talking yesterday and we had this wonderful conversation about what's entheogenic and what isn't. Um, we tend to think of, we, when we talk about entheogens and psychedelics, you know, we tend to go to, you know, ayahuasca, San Pedro and peyote, uh, LSD, MDMA, those sorts of things. And in my own medicine journey, uh, it, it was really cool to have this confirmed from, from Lori is that there are lots of ways to have to achieve that altered state and they're all the theogenic experiences. And it's really, it's sort of like, it's this interaction with yourself and plant medicines or, your, or with you, with your consciousness in yourself that produce these theogenic effects and, and, and the connections with people. And so she's gonna talk uh, about that. So there you go, Lori, you're, you're up. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm really happy to share this information with all of you about like, uh, what is my personal story or my personal path. Um, this uh, many years I'm having working with uh, Native American groups, but also with Afro American groups and people really from Africa and also from from cultures that are like super, super remote in Mexico. Uh, one of them are the people from Mokaya or Jope people. Those people are working and still with the sacred power of the seeds. So uh, as uh, Gerardo start also the, the journey with Peyote in Mexico, I think the most close uh, first interaction is uh, working with corn or having this call from the corn. Like in Mexico, we have like a privilege to be eating um, the, the medicine uh, from, from the original 
uh, region, no? Like from forests, from mountains, from village, or from the desert, or from different parts of the Mexico that is growing these kind of uh, flowers, seeds, and cactus. So we have the opportunity to take it from the ground, from wild. Uh, and as, as we were speaking before, um, these medicine plants are uh, like uh, normal consumption even that are like uh, this uh, definition of what is a narcotic in Mexico or what it's an illegal substance. We know that all these plants are master plants for us. And how we know that like for many, many years before the conquest in Mexico uh, was like a grade of who can consume these plants or not. Uh, but in the regular, regular uh, citizenship for for example in the regions that are like uh, all the original towns are divided no from people from the coast people people from the central valley of mexico or the uh, mayan Pelins mayan peninsula that is another kind of different herbalism uh, or caribbean medicine is totally different no in different regions so the context of this kind of uh, juice is like, you can use it as a tea or put it in the food or put it as a treatment, but especially this kind of juices was uh, provided for a, a doctor or the priestess, the priest and the priestess. And they were using these plants to provide the treatment to the ill person or for diseases. In that context before, of course, were people that were uh, uh, with this kind of like uh, unbalance in the spirit or soul or body. And the diseases were totally different. So to kind of like understand what's, what's happening in that period of times in our situation right now, the wisdom is like, we are not totally healed like we are always here in in this uh living situation to to get some uh opportunity to evolve so when you get the call of, of one of these cultures like my friends or myself i feel more the calling from the mayan people and the zapotec people they were especially with the concept of the roots of light so it's like a us have own roots on there and we are trying to feel this um, light from the earth so i want to refer like all the medicine plants or like our first contact with the the shamanism or entheogenics is to be connected with uh, this personal development and given an exchange. So it's always this interaction, like in your story, Bob, or like in Gerardo's story, uh, it depends uh, if it's the first time. Like for me uh, personally, the first encounter I have was with um, psilocin mushroom, with wild mushrooms and was in a, in a ceremonial way, was like a old get in, a, in the forest and try to, to wildcraft the fresh uh, mushrooms and get all this flesh uh, beaten in like a really, really slow to absorb all this like a juice inside the mouth. And it's when I realized like before that experience that happened years or years ago, uh, it's when you realize like the entheogenic world in Mexico or in another part of the world or in, in traditional medicine or uh, other medicine like uh, traditionals, uh, it's always something uh, bitter. The medicine is bitter or chocolate is also bitter or all the medicines are super bitter. So it's this um, definition of also that it is bitter on us or on a bitter situation, it's something you need to heal. And I remember my first time when I tried Yahetu and another ceremony was in a corn crop, in a, a corn field, also in an encounter of different, um, was a Mayan wedding. Um, 
the interesting thing was when I tried your hair for the first time, the taste on my mouth was like, oh, my memory was like, I remembered this flavor. So it's, a, it's that exchange that is like, what are you connected or that you are ready to do the communication with the plant? And to get in that emotional plane, that is uh, how it smells, what is the speed of the plant? Like uh, many other entheogenics has a speed too. So I try to don't get involved in the master plant medicine because in Mexico is really a uh, really huge taboo for the prohibi uh, was prohibited even the corn and chocolate for uh, Christianism. Um, for the conquerors was even a, a, like a witchcraft to use chocolate or vanilla or flowers that you, we use like um, especially flowers that are red flowers. So this kind of red uh, uh, flowers are related with the, the blood. So all these medicine plants work, work with the uh, blood, uh, with the circulation and the heart. So it starts like uh, giving a lot of like uh, sh shivering or shaking in and changing the temperature. So these medicine plants, I was more interested in to know what are the names of these plants. So I started researching about the names of these plants and I, actually, I was always curious about um, a god that we call Xochipilli. So I just started researching about Xochipilli and their, their cult, that is an um, Aztec cult of Xochipilli. So in the posture he has, he is in this position like this, you know, like a flower lotus, but he has the hands like this, and he's also having the eyes and like the pupils are all open when you take MDMA or ketamine or this substance that the pupil get really, really open. And also the ears, the, ER, the ears are like a huge plugs open. So this position is interesting why he has this position and it's because he is the master guardian of the flowers. His name is the prince of the flowers and um, in their body, uh, it has all this uh, beautiful legacy of the plants of the gods, that is peyote, psilocybin, morning glory, datura, uh, uh, peyote, and other differences that are the siniquichi, that are the elixir of the sun, that is a really good uh, an amplifier of the senses, and um, also it has another that is called um, uh, like a red myrt is like a, a red flower. Uh, so I think these edible flowers, you can use it in all the medicine plants. But now we are uh, experiencing this kind of like uh, situation and like the different consumption in the Eastern or the native groups is totally different. And we need to provide this solution. So I'm really interested into the world big wisdom. It's to provide these um, different uh, friends, no? make them friends of the plant. So we need to grow these plants that um, traditionally can grow like a wild, like uh, I think also, uh, uh, marijuana is also wild. It grows naturally. And also in Mexico, we have also um, uh, poppy, the poppy seed that is from the mountains is wild. So all these situations are all around the, the narcotics and what are we not totally understand if it's a taboo to use it or not to use it. So I choose the path of the sacred uh, juices. So I'm, I'm not use regularly uh, medicines or medicine plants are try to more to do the rituals on the full moon, on the new moon or situations that involve that is 
a special equinox and a special eclipse and a special solstice and to try to connect and the path that take me to this is because people were asking me to hold the space so uh, i think it's important um to to re to realize that uh, some of the some of us are uh trying to hold the space for others and uh, also the medicines are holding the space for us to connect with them be friends with them and i'm really grateful especially with the uh, the the seed of cacao that is the name it's cacao 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 and it means uh, bitter water so when we are trying to understand what is the effect that has all these medicines in our body is really the the how is our blood uh how is our water the level of water we have on us and that is healing us is the water we have inside. So uh, for me, the experience uh, with the chocolate for first time, first time was the, and another um, gift because this is the that we know that if these plants are right to your life, it's for a gift from Mother Earth. And as my friend Gerardo, where he was. Um, uh, trying to explain us, um, the Asian people try to give us the gift also to understand this with their art, like Chipibo people, or in Colombia with the necklace or the embroidery, the textiles, they give us this gift and they give this exchange or the, how they were feeling. Now I think our level in the Mayan, like uh, we have the pyramids, it's the evolution. So uh, in this part of the world we are living right now, it's the matrix to enter in this digital uh, bubble. But it's like uh, when you also con consume some kind of dose of DMT on your body. So you enter in another dimension and we need to, to be aware that is also something that is not real. So the Mayan word, it means delusions. So when the Mayan teachers of the Mayan elders are doing the, the ceremonies, they are always try to teach you that uh, mental illness, depression, or something that is a trauma, because especially us that are really sensitive or empathic persons, uh, I think everybody in the in the group of Thank You Plant Medicine is really, really empathic with different situations they live before, or also how to develop uh, some kind of um, medical practice, no? Like uh, really fundamental in something that is uh, also a profession. Um, I think uh, we need to start like uh, uh, trying to solve uh, these problems in the society and coming together with the plants and our own different parts of our body, you know, spirit, human, body, soul, and try to be more pure because it's that uh, I'm studying also the other, uh, other calendars and it's not like a legend or a myth or mythology. It's like a when you connect with the sacred plants or the sacred gods or they give you the this opening uh, or in a ceremony it's more important the message that the vision sometimes you don't remember the vision because are like a super fast or super like a fractalic or or juicy faces or animals or the fears or the voices noises so the in that moment it's like uh remember the message if you see someone or you see a, a, a elder or native people or an animal that is speaking to you or that you return like physically in like a situation that you remember was a mistake I think you can reevaluate uh, how you can evolve and 
for us in the culture of a committee group, uh, we are trying to, to, to people understand that everybody experienced the holy drama that is in the family uh, uh, core we have. So it's also like a, for us, is uh, San Pedro or Peyote are like that or the masculine and mushrooms and uh, ayahuasca, it's like a female energy. So it tried to have the balance of the this and respect to them and how approach with these plants and to, to evolve with the pact we do with the gods because it's like some, something that sounds really like religious or like out of context. Like, no, I don't want to know everything about gods or religions or uh, this, but at the end of the day, uh, someone is the creator of these plants or her creator. <laughs> So it's just my, my, my story and I, if someone has some question, I would like also to, to share something uh, more specific. Bob, you're on mute. Um, does anyone have Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I I, I have the same question for you, Laurie, that I, I had for Gerardo. What if you can if you can share one insight uh, that you think can be beneficial for the world we want to create today uh, from your vast experience? Because you described a lot of different experiences. If there is like one insight, what one take home lesson, and uh, that you know, listeners, the people watching this uh, uh, this storytelling hour uh, can say, yeah, you know, okay, that's the lesson that Laurie got from from experience related to the world and what we want to create in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, uh, it's like uh, trying to encourage also the people to uh, to connect more with a frequency that feels good like if you think it's something weird or the consumption of some substance, it's probably not the path you you need to go, no? <laughs> like, so I think I, uh, for me, it's really hard also to come in out. So I have a lot of people behind myself and there are here also another ladies with me. Yeah, listen us and they are one like they are like do it go say it because in my family or is and uh gerardo said in the mexicans group we cannot speak about uh peyote mushrooms um uh, heroin is like the huge like oh no that is not good <laughs> And other grandmas or people that lives in that region are like, oh, I love the poppy flower. It looks amazing. It grows behind my garden. So why not to go more in that like a uh, third eye opening and heart opening to set, encouraging to see the good, encouraging to feel good. Also, it's applying everything aspect on your life, like a uh, with persons or trying to see the good things. And I think I have hearing a lot of comments like this pandemic, it's like, oh, this is good for me because I'm getting more relaxed. I'm doing home office, oh, help me with this. But then the other scenario is also this transition of everybody needs to return in the garden, return to meditate, return to the breathing and it's a really uh, for me this year we lost one of the master of the like you know it exists the red path the white path the yellow path and the black path so one of the mexican black path uh, elders he died and he he was uh, teaching the food importance how how you heal with uh, food alimentation and he said to us you can do uh, four 
form uh, practices in your life and you're gonna be okay. That is breathing uh, correctly, uh, drinking water, eating correctly, and uh, sleep, sleeping. So it's a really basic information we can share, not related with plants or narcotics or uh, different ceremonies, uh, rituals. So we can also provide this information. And then for me, world wisdom is that not try to, to remember the people that we are not alone in the, in the like minded people probably we can uh, disagree with some people or disagree with some tribes or disagree with some practices. But I think all of us needs a shelter, food, clean water, and uh, relaxation and to, to have these uh, commons, no? commodities that are uh, really easy to to do, but it takes a lot of effort to do the educational part. So there's also is a thing that is probably the point is to make more education educational spaces and to to encourage the positive thinking. Well, thank you so much, uh, Laurie. That was was brilliant. Um, thank you, Laurie. All right, so uh, part of one of my jobs is uh, to be the keeper of the time. So let's uh, start moving on. So then our next storyteller is Lisa Ward. She's a combo practitioner and homeopathic registered with um, IAKP, which is the International Association of Combo Practitioners, originally working in the fi in financial services, but due to the drastic change in her life, she now helps others to find their power in healing. Lisa works in collaboration with another plant medicine therapist and retreats to create shifts for people that are ready to heal. So she plans to start, tell a story about how ayahuasca helped her heal her fibromyalgia and deal with a brain cyst. So Lisa, you're up. Um, you can, don't forget to turn off, turn on your mic. There you go. That's, <clears throat> thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Um, yeah, it's such a pleasure to share and listen to the stories. Wow, just amazing. Such a beautiful energy. <clears throat> Well, my story started uh, in the financial services and um, I worked, uh, you know, I was sort of happy in my work, but I knew something was, you know, it wasn't my calling, wasn't quite what I wanted to do. Um, and it was in 2012 that I suddenly became unwell um, and I was very quickly uh, diagnosed with a cyst on my brain, which is quite large, the size of a, of a golf ball. And um, also I had, you know, chronic pain through my body, which um, over a couple of months became worse and worse. And um, the pain was debilitating. Um, uh, the, the illness was progressive in a way that, uh, you know, I could no longer feel parts of my body. I could no longer move. I was incontinent. I was in a wheelchair and then bed bound for a couple of years. And I start with that little quick part of my story, you know, but it, 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 would, it took about six years of my life to get through that part. But um, the reason why I start with that so quickly is this is what brought me back to, you know, the real purpose, what I feel uh, I had and uh, to bring me back into alignment with um, who I was, what I needed um, and what my purpose purpose will be. And I think the great awakening and time of evolution that we're going through. So I grew up in South Africa and I was always part of uh, a big family, farming communities, and also part of uh, African communities and shamanism or Sangomas as they called in South Africa, which are essentially uh, uh, medicine people. So uh, working in ceremony was something that um, was quite natural to me and something I was quite um, familiar with and also plant medicines from Africa um, that I knew but I became very disconnected from it in my adult life and then you know moving from Africa to the United Kingdom from tribe from spirit from connection 
Um, and so uh, it was through this, this illness um, that I became more aware of, you know, maybe I should go back to my roots and try and find the answers again. Uh, where, where does this come from? What can I do to make it better? And you know, one of the amazing things was that uh, a neuro, neurologist said to me that there was nothing more medically that can be done for me. And that this was sort of the end of the road and I needed to make myself as comfortable as I could. Um, but there was nothing medically that they can further do for me except for keeping me comfortable with painkillers and, and that sort of thing. But it was at that point that he said there was nothing more that can be done for me that I thought, well, there's nothing more you can do for me, but there must be something I can do for myself. There must be some way that I can claim back the power that I have been given away, you know. And I think we, we tend to give our power away a lot when it comes to uh, conventional medicine and doctors and specialists. When they tell us that we've come to the end of the road, we accept that and think that, you know, this is it. Uh, there is there is no other alternative out there. This is what's available to me. And this is one of the main reasons why I come out and share my story so openly and so freely is to tell people that, you know, there is alternative ways out there. And uh, we need to look back at uh, our roots, culture, plant medicine. Um, my healing journey, uh, to be fair, was not only through plant medicine, but I, I will briefly touch on the other things that really started off my journey. One of the first things that I started doing uh, while I was still bed bound was really working on myself and meditation, deep study of spiritual teachings and making a connection with myself to understand what has brought this illness into manifestation. What is trying to show me what is what is bringing this through me into the world? And it was through this study that I, I came across a woman called Dolores Cannon, which is a, a, a hypnotherapist or a past life regression therapist. And she works in a very specific way where you can go through a past life and then you connect with your higher self. I uh, very quickly started booking sessions with a therapist that was very close to me. Um, so I was very blessed to have somebody on my doorstep. And I think that synchronicity was, was really amazing. And it was through past life regression that I realized that uh, the illness, first of all, uh, no longer needed to be there. And that I was creating this illness in my life that I didn't want to be unwell, but I needed to be unwell. Now, uh, that was a great realization. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever worked with past life regression, but when you speak to the higher self or, or the guide that comes through during this deep state of, of, of meditation, the answers you get is not what you can imagine. It's not, um, you know, it's very to the point. Um, and, you know, there's not a lot of answers, you know, it's, it's, it's very basically to the point. But it was re reflection afterwards that I started thinking, how was I creating this illness in my life? What was I doing? And I realized there must have been something from my childhood, something in my life that, that created this imbalance in my life and that I needed to deal with it. And um, I also, through a past life, knew that I was bringing some trauma. I brought some trauma from a past life through to this life. Um, and it was through that process that I realized I was creating this illness in my life that I started doing more work and how I can undo what I was thinking uh, really doing deep work on myself this started a process where I started to become uh, better um, and then I started weaning myself off medications that I was on uh, a lot of morphine uh, all, all these anti-anxiety medication I was put on um, you know where doctors no longer knew what to do so they just throw everything at it and hoping something will work um, but I was able to wean myself off all these medications over a, over about eight months um, and I, I did it with a medical professional I have to say I didn't just go at it myself it's very important for anybody wanting to come off 
medicine to work with a medical professional and not just to take it into their own hands. So please be very careful around that. Um, it was also then at that point that I knew about ayahuasca for a while. I've heard about the plant medicine and I knew there was something that I needed to discover about my life to create the shift that I needed, but I wasn't sure what it was. So ayahuasca uh, was my main teacher and um, I, I took ayahuasca once I was off the medication and I took it in Europe. Uh, where I went to attend a retreat there, where I took ayahuasca for the first time. And the experience was very intense. It was two ceremonies I had over two days and was incredibly intense. Um, I experienced a lot about my childhood um, and I was shown things about my childhood and I'll just briefly touch on what it was. And my parents left me with my grandmother when I was about three years old. And at that time, I experienced some rejection. And after about a year or so, they came to fetch me again for my grandmother. This was a double rejection because I bonded with my grandmother. And although I, I knew about the story, but I was never aware that it was really a problem. And I, I just knew it was something in my past, but never really understanding that it was a problem around abandonment for me. It was at that point that I realized I was holding on to the illness because I was feeding my childhood trauma around abandonment. And that, you know, being unwell, people was not going to abandon me. And um, I had carers that came in and looked after me, family, friends, gave me more attention. They were there for me and they weren't going to leave me. So I was feeding into this whole idea of, you know, uh, abandonment and not wanting to be abandoned but the amazing thing that I experienced through ayahuasca was that it showed me what why my parents did what they did at the time what they were going through I didn't just see it but I felt what they were going through at the time and it was such an incredible experience I felt so much love and empathy for them and I realized that you know it was really all about them and never about me. They were doing the best they could at the time and they were going through such an incredibly difficult time themselves. And that process of understanding and love and empathy that I felt for them in the process, it healed a lot around my abandonment. And so my healing journey with applied medicine continued. I mean, I've taken it a couple of times since then. And just working deeply was, you know, ancestors and it was so beautiful to to, to hear uh, Laura talk about uh, you know ancestors and ancestor work and uh, I connected deeply with my ancestors uh, for the first time in my life and that was so incredible to to work with that and, and the healing that I that I experienced through not healing but the knowledge and the wisdom that I knew you know what was behind me because we are the total sum of all of those that came before us, you know, and uh, uh, we are them and they're always in us and, and part of us and, and we can draw on their, on their wisdom and power. And um, it took me about two and a half years to get back to normal where I, I now live a, uh, a relatively normal life. And I would say relatively normal because I sometimes do get headaches and I'd like to point out that this is not a complete healing as such because I still have a cyst in my brain and it's not causing me any severe problems but it is very managed um, in terms of uh, my own way and following certain diets looking after myself drinking lots of water and uh, you know looking after myself I see you smiling it was so beautiful to hear uh, you know how important water is yeah so it's all for me it's all about diet it's all about looking after myself uh, you know, in that way. And so I continued to work with the medicine uh, quite extensively for a while. Um, and I, I now I'm in a place with the medicine where I, uh, it's more about celebration and connection uh, to myself, to others, to tribe, uh, the role I play in, in, in helping others uh, through the plant medicine, um, also working with psilocybin, uh, which is also another incredible medicine 
and uh, purely microdosing. I mean, I don't really push the boundaries in terms of, you know, wanting to trip with it or having experiences with it, because I think I would always continue to work with a medicine, but there's a point where it's when you've heard the message, when do you hang up the phone? You know, how much more do you keep digging and digging and digging, you know? Um, and I've been so blessed to have experienced so much healing and, 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 uh, and, and it's changed my life in such a significant way that I feel, you know, I don't need to push the boundaries with it so much, but I do take it as uh, a celebration, uh, as a way of, 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 of celebration in, in special occasions and so on, uh, which I feel is, is very powerful. And I think for me with plant medicine and my healing journey, which I now help others to, you know, connect with themselves and, and, and what it means to have trauma in your life. The message I took away from it that um, not all trauma or bad things that happen to us in our life needs to be healed. I think a lot of it needs to be seen for what it is true blessings from the divine that changes our life paths and bring us in alignment. And I think it's the yin and yang of life. You know, sometimes when we go in one direction too much, then the other one brings us back and it's that dance of life, you know, and I think it was so beautiful. Somebody mentioned earlier that we're not meant to be always happy. We're not meant to be always perfect. You know, we're meant to, to, to go through a school and part of learning is going through challenges. And, you know, that my challenges certainly didn't end with me, uh, you know, becoming better. My challenges just shift slightly, but they're still there. They're still there. Uh, but I think you, you're better able to cope with it. And I think sometimes... Uh, we live in a culture where we think everything needs to be healed and there's a lot of emphasis placed on that. And I think that is important and there's a place in that. But I think sometimes our challenges needs to be seen for what they are, uh, not as a bad thing, but perhaps as a blessing of taking us forward. Um, so uh, I think, yeah, that, that was a really important part for me to realize and, and one that I really am very passionate about helping and teaching others, uh, you know, through Cambo uh, and the work that I do with people um, and, uh, you know, more becoming acceptance, accepted of our lives, who we are, uh, self-love for our journeys. We are our biggest gurus. <laughs> Any questions? Welcome. So I, I do have one question about, did, did you, when did you start using the Cambo and, in what was the combo related to your recovery from the fibromyalgia or was it more in the, 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 the mental shifts that you made from the ayahuasca? Sure. Well, it was actually during ayahuasca that I met the frog spirit came to me in ceremony and very powerful. And the majority of my ceremony was, was, uh, you know, very, uh, overpowered by the frog spirit. And at the time I didn't realize exactly what it was, but, it was through integration with people afterwards that I realized, you know, maybe it could be Cambo. And so at that time, I was still experiencing chronic pain, especially in my legs, were really severe. And so once I used my first uh, ceremony with Cambo, I, th the connection I found with the medicine was incredible. It was just incredible. I knew from that point onwards that this was going to be my calling and this is how I was going to facilitate shifts for other people to find perhaps, you know, that healing within themselves. Because I believe, um, well, no matter what tools you use, you know, the tools uh, uh, can be wonderful. But if you don't know how to build a house with it, you know, the tools will be useless to you. So, um, yeah, Cambo played a big part in my journey of healing. Um, and uh, I worked very extensively with it and, and even my initiation with it and, and, and the training I went through, extensive training uh, with Cambo. Cambo played a major part in my healing. Towards the end of uh, the shift that I experienced through ayahuasca, um, I started with the Cambo, which was my final sort of push. And, uh, but I, I didn't realize at the time that it was going to become such a major part of my life in helping others and 
m amazingly, uh, I now treat doctors and uh, uh, medical professionals. Uh, mm -hmm. The very same people that said, you know, they can no longer do anything for me, come to sit with Cambo and we all need healing. Brilliant, thank you so much. Any more questions? All right, so we're, um, uh, we're at the, we have about 15 minutes left of the scheduled program. Uh, I suspect Jonathan will end up going over a little bit. Um, you, you guys are welcome to stay. I don't plan to turn this off right at two o'clock. So, and so that's also for you, Jonathan. Don't feel like you have to get it all done in 15 minutes, unless you have someplace to be. Um, so we're, we're, we'll, we'll move on. So our last storyteller is uh, Jonathan. He's um, Jonathan Glazer. He's the founder of Thank You Plant Medicine. Uh, he, he was born in Israel and has lived in Costa Rica for the last 17 years. He's 41 years old and has been an entrepreneur since his 20s and today has a 13-year-old uh, security company. In parallel to his professional career, he has uh, developed a deep meditation practice, initially through yoga style and in, in the last 15 years with a teacher for Tibetan style meditation. He holds a degree in psychology and has an interest in neuroscience and the mind-body connection. We share that interest, Jonathan. So Jonathan will be sharing a story about his introduction to plant medicine and how his approach to his company, groups, and collaboration changed. Three years ago in Costa Rica, labor regulations changed, and these changes meant many companies in his industry faced bankruptcy. Through an invitation from a friend to participate in an ayahuasca ceremony and, con and the consequent experience, he discovered the solution that carried his company through the storm and safely to shore. And I think in a lot of ways also brought us all, brought us all together. And so thank you very much for your, your work. Thank you for sharing your story. And uh, without further ado, Jonathan. Thank you so much, Bob. It's, um, it's a great honor to be here with distinguished uh, uh, human beings and, and amazing stories. Um, I'm not a really good storyteller, so I'm going to do my best. It's the only thing I can do. Uh, my, as, as you say, my background is uh, meditation. And, and just as you, Bob, I was uh, presented to or arrived to entogenic plants uh, and psychedelics uh, fairly recently, about four years ago. Uh, and I want to tell uh, my second experience that uh, of, uh, of doing plant medicine. Uh, my first experience with entogens was with, uh, with ayahuasca. It was a very light experience. And then two years passed. And in those two years, I was facing uh, a lot of difficulties in, in my uh, professional life. Uh, as you said, uh, in Costa Rica, there were labor reforms and changes in laws that reflected on many, many companies in the industry. And as I was working on it for about 10 years by then, I was seeing how, you know, the, the house I, I built can go crumbling down and uh, fear reaction, the natural fear reaction is freeze, flight or fight. And I basically froze for a year and a half. And I, I didn't really know how to, how to deal with the situation. Uh, so a serendipitous moment came uh, around about 2017, where a friend uh, said, hey, John, you, you want to come to a ceremony uh, today? Uh, no preparation. It was Sunday. And, and I said, you know what? Sure. <laughs> I have nothing to lose. And I uh, joined him on this trip going up the mountain in Costa Rica. So Costa Rica is very high mountains. Uh, the mountains go up to uh, 3,800 meters. So it's almost, I think, 12,000, 13,000 feet. And there is a beautiful center in one of those mountains where my friend took me to. And uh, all the way there, I, you know, I, I love nature. So we really enjoy the ride and it's kind of a mountainous road, beautiful vistas for, you know, a tropical forest going up really high and big tree. Great conversation and, you know, we're good friends for quite a while. And I get there and, and the place uh, give me the sensation of calmness, you know, uh, within the turmoil of my life. 
uh, trees, birds, rivers, yeah. typical Costa Rican scenery. A uh, little bit chilly because mountain. Uh, and we go to the river. And I'm really this question of how I solve this huge problem I have in my businesses, like in my mind and you know, what, what am I afraid of? Uh, because one of the lessons I learned over the years is whenever I'm afraid of something, it means I need to go there. <laughs> so it's, it's like somehow fear is actually signal, signaling me where I need to go uh, with, with physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. And so this concept of what am I afraid of was in my mind for quite a while during that drive and, and uh, when we arrived uh, to the retreat. Uh, so we go, go to the river and we hang out in, the, in this very cold mountain river and it's chilly, and like, I don't know, like probably 10 degrees Celsius or 15, which I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit, but it's pretty cold. And I go into the river and I meditate. So I freeze, right? You get really cold, so I do the breathing and I meditate and I close my eyes. And the answer to my fear came in that moment, just before the ceremony, actually. And the answer of what I was afraid of, it was to deal with problems within a group together. Meaning that for years I'm having my problems on my back and pretty much owning them, but you know, trying to do things on my own. And I realized I'm afraid of working with groups. And it's actually connected to what we're doing here today. We're working as a group, yeah? And uh, everybody brings their 50 cents and bring their ideas and, and we think together how we can make the world better. Uh, so I'm in the river, this vision of me being scared, you know, super scared about dealing with everybody together and, and working with everybody together and, and realizing that that's a solution for my personal difficulties uh, for my organization and understanding that everybody is, in touch, is as responsible for the outcome of what's going to happen as I am, because we're all part of the same organization. And the fact that I kind of founded it and, and initiated it doesn't mean that I need to carry it on my own. And it's, it's, you know, it's an obvious lesson for many people that work in organizations, but for me at the time, it wasn't obvious, like many lessons that we learn on the way. Other people would understand it easily, but you don't see it from your own vantage point. So, you know, four, four hours later, I am in the second ceremony, second entogen experience of my life. And a whole new world opens up to me because as you have experienced, uh, or whomever experienced entogens, they, uh, open you possibilities to how to drive your mind and experience your emotions and your past and your future in a completely different way. It basically uh, gave me uh, capabilities that within my normal consciousness, I might not have had uh, or I, I didn't have before. So for the next six hours of the experience, I am seeing all my difficulties from many, many vantage points. And I'm able to come with a solution at the end of the experience to uh, the disaster I'm, I'm facing. I'm actually, was, I was actually in the ceremony because I was a little, I was a little bit too loud. <laughs> and, and you know, it's like, hey, John, you wanna go out a little bit and relax? And it was actually great because I was sitting under the stars, you know, with the Milky Way on top and the birds of the night and, and beautiful trees and the wind and, you know, had a fantastic experience on that, that, you know, outing from, from the ceremonial space. So fast forward and uh, the next day I uh, drive home. I drive home and, you know, my mind is kind of seeing what I need to do and how to do it and, and you know, year and a half of accumulation of tension, absolutely released and a eureka moment. And I sit on my, on my computer and hour, I write a solution and a plan for a year and a half. And fast forward a year and a half from that moment, I did it, I sold it. My, my company survived 
I, what I did basically is talk to everybody in the company. We were at the time 140 people and put everybody together and say, guys, this is the issue. We need to solve it together. How do we do it? And then you start finding out that, that everybody has the same interest. They want to keep their space. They want to keep their organization going. And um, it was changed the way I deal with things today. I, today, I, I, I look to create collaboration. And I, I never think I can do it alone uh, or I should do it alone. Uh, so it, it completely you know, transformed how I view things. And that somehow channeled into, into the Thank You Plant Medicine and you know, what we are doing together as a, as a collective. Uh, because only us coming together and creating trust and communicating with each other and, and being and holding space for each other can create a change for things that we care for. So we care for the plant medicines, we care for the ancient traditions, we care for, uh, you know, for people to have access to natural remedies that actually work. Uh, and, and today it's not just, you know, a subjective matter, it's, it's very objective. There is enough research to show that it actually works. So that, that, that first plant medicine experience projected to where, we are, where I am today uh, with how I see the world. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's one of my stories. Of course, afterwards, and just like you, Bob, uh, when you started uh, about four years ago, and suddenly you, you figure out that there's all these possibilities, then you engage with it more. And uh, what I did specifically is that just as with my meditation practice, I look at it as, an, as a practice. I look at it as a, as to be covered over and over and over and over again from different uh, angles and deepening my connection to myself to my uh, environment and to the planet uh, so the people around me and and to the planet we are on uh, so so it's interesting yeah uh, I, I want to say that the take-home lesson for me is creating more space for us to connect on a global level uh, and, and I think that there lies the solution. And it's not that we need to, uh, I, I, think, I think our job is to create nice, beautiful, safe space for us to be and hang out. Yeah. And that was, that's one of my main insights. And that's why I love so much the world of wisdom uh, uh, and what Nielsen and, uh, is doing and Amit is that they're creating a space for us to come together. And uh, here we are and we interchange and interact and it's an opportunity for future projects as we create this kind of projects together. So every, every interaction is a stepping stone for the next interaction that we can have. And we have Lori from Mexico and Gerardo uh, talking about uh, peyote and, and medicine within the native context uh, Bob, you're a, you're a professor, uh, a teacher, you know, and, and, and this, this perspective, this ch different perspectives, uh, uh, yeah, they, they, they contribute uh, to a potential future collaborations between all of us. And that's, that's what I feel about it. Um, so thank you very much for uh, putting the story, story out, Bob. And I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, um, John. This is brilliant. It, so many things came up for me in your story. I'm, I'm, I think I was very much like you about when it comes to um, uh, when, when it comes to collaboration. I tend to just try to do it myself. Um, I haven't gotten that message about collaboration quite yet for, from the from the medicine. Um, but it was that really that like that just really resonated this idea of like not having to carry it all carry it all alone. So it's, I think we have, all right. So you can put questions in Q and A or you can just turn off, you can go on mic and, and, um, and ask questions, no? Yeah, we've been at it for a long time. Well, we made it till two o'clock. Good job getting that done in 15 minutes, Jonathan. <laughs> Great. So thank you so much. 
Thank you to Jonathan. Thank you to Lori. Thank you to Geraldo. And thank you to Lisa. What brilliant stories. I've been doing this for about three years. And every time I do it, people amaze me. I mean, I've yet to get to that point where uh, where it's just become old hat. And this is another one of those moments. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, tune in till tomorrow. So we're going to do this for the next well, counting, counting today's four days, so for the next three days. Tomorrow, we're going to be doing it at 11 o'clock. So it's going to be a little earlier. And then the following two days, we'll go back to 12 o'clock. If anybody wants to um, tell a story, um, I'm going to put this in the chat. You can, you can um, email me. Uh, we, still have some, we still have some slots available, um, so just so shoot me an email and we can get things coordinated. So I, I guess that's it. Does anyone want to add anything before we close the session? Yeah, maybe, really? so, Bob, we, we talked a little bit about the, the plan for the next few days. So okay. we are going to be hosting on the same, on the same uh, camp in the World of Wisdom, uh, going to be hosting a woman's circle, Red Tent, uh, with Lori. We're going to be we're going to have a, a men's circle as well, and uh, discussing uh, men in medicine. Uh, we are going to have uh, medicine music as well, and the participation and the importance of medicine of music within the uh, medicine context of the entogenes and plant medicine. Uh, and well, if if you want to contribute to collaborate, you're always welcome to comment and and bring your gift. Uh, this is a, a collaboration between uh, friends and people in the community of Thank You Plant Medicine. So you're invited to join. Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. guys. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.